Greetings class, welcome to another session here in uh, Kala Descriptions, um, talking a little bit about the Kala um, approach to teaching second language. Uh, this week uh, we're going to be looking at uh, literacy development or teaching uh, students how to read and write. Um, and we're going to take a look at some of the literacy profiles that exist, we'll look at some of the factors that influence uh, English literacy, and then we'll talk about teaching uh, literacy using the uh, the color system. Remember, the color system also includes strategies, and it's in an academic setting. Uh, the uh, the chapter begins here with a description of what entails, uh, not what entails, but uh, what are the four areas or the four profiles of a typical second language learner. You've got young kids with little, little or no literacy in their first language. In other words, these are young kids that don't know how to read and write in their own language. Um, so uh, th that's the, the first type. The second type are kids that have a beginning or an emerging uh, understanding of their first language um, literacy. They know how to read some things in their first language. They know how to write some things in their first language. These kids, at least according to the description here, are basically they're on par in their own language for literacy. You then have uh, older kids and adolescents that have, again, little or no literacy in their first language. Uh, in all honesty, uh, you can go to adults that have little or no literacy in their first language. Because they have this limit, it's going to be more difficult for them to learn second language, obviously. Um, they don't know anything about sound to grapheme uh, connections. They don't know anything about any of the conventions of writing. Um, they understand the spoken elements of it, but they don't have not seen it down on paper, and therefore it's going to be more difficult for them. And then there are kids and adolescents with a normal uh, first language literacy. Uh, so kids uh, B and D are going to be uh, have fewer difficulties when setting when learning a second language because they have some knowledge already. The kids in D um, and even the adolescents in D should be able to learn even faster because they have a complete knowledge of their first language and un and will be uh, more apt to understand the components and the requirements um, in a second language as opposed to someone who has none in the uh, in their first language. Anyway, so these are the four basic literacy types that uh, Shamat talks about in her in her descriptions, and obviously because of the differences that you may have in your class, if you have well, if older students are are A or C, you know, then life is a little easier because then it's a more uh, it's a more homogeneous type of group, and it's going to be uh, easier to set up materials. If you have groups from if you have students from all different types, obviously it's, it's going to be more difficult because you have to take into account the differences with the students and have more of a differentiated style of teaching. Factors that influence English literacy. Um, I don't think this is all of them, but uh, this is certainly some of them. One is academic oral proficiency. How well can students uh, communicate in the academy and school? Um, uh, there are also uh, uh, personality factors as well that aren't listed here. Although someone may be academically proficient uh, orally, they may also be very shy or very quiet or very intimidated, and they're not going to be able to do things as, uh, as well. Their first language literacy, as we just noted, is going to be a factor. Again, the more they know in their first language, the better it's going to be for their second language. Um, their first language is also going to be a factor. You know, it's not listed here. Their first language would be a factor because languages that are further away from the uh, syntax and lexicon of English is going to be more difficult for them to learn English. The inverse will also be true. If you're a native speaker trying to learn a second language and you're learning and your desire is to lear learn a language that is uh, lexically distant from English, in other words, their syntax is very different uh, or I should say opposite from uh, English. Uh, their vocabulary is very opposite or very different from uh, from English. It's going to be more difficult. Learning Spanish, for example, uh, because they are similar in syntax and in lexicon, it's going to be faster for you to learn. Uh, you'll be able to learn words like nation because there is a similar cognate in English. Uh, if you're going to be learning uh, nation in another language like Chinese or 
uh, Japanese. Uh, there is no cognate whatsoever, and so there's nothing to hook that onto so that you can learn it. So language is also going to play a factor in English literacy. One's cultural or family beliefs about literacy is also going to play a significant role. Uh, and this is primarily going back to this whole idea of uh, how much literacy a kid knows. Uh, there are some cultures who, um, there are some cultures where families um, speak to their kids as if they're adults. They read to their kids even when, uh, you know, they're still in the crib. And because there is a lot of attention paid to um, reading and writing and uh, direct contact, direct communication with kids, getting them to learn to read early, uh, those cultures, those families are going to have a better opportunity, a greater success at learning a foreign language. Cultures and families that um, basically ignore children until the children are old enough to, to uh, communicate uh, and allow things to happen without their influence and intervention. Those types of cultures are going to have students with it that will have more difficulty in learning a second language. The interesting thing, however, is that those family types, those cultural, those cultures that uh, de-emphasize academic slash reading to their kids, uh, they generally have a very strong oral uh, history. Um, they tell stories much more than than in uh, the literature-based uh, type of societies. Um, but anyway, they're going to have a greater difficulty if their literacy beliefs um, are not conducive to language learning, not conducive to increasing one's ability to uh, read and write. Finally, there are a whole bunch of difficulties in English. <laughs> um, I enjoyed studying Spanish because there's like a 97 or 98 percent ratio of graphene to uh, phoneme. Um, basically, what you read is what is spoken. There are no changes in pronunciation. Uh, in the English language, we have one word that's pronounced two different ways depending on its context. Um, so, for example, we have the word uh, Polish and we have the word polish. They're the same word and yet uh, they're pronounced completely differently depending on the, the location or the, the context that it's in. There are other examples that we could look at. We can look at, for example, the word uh, input, and it can be input or input. We can look at uh, import, and that can be import or import, right? I imported the imports, and so they're pronounced differently. We have this word, which is lead and lead, right? Uh, we have... Uh, read and read. It's the same spelling and yet all of these words are pronounced differently. I love this ending of words. Whoops. Uh, uh, let's just use this then. O-U-G-H. I mean we have we have dough, we have cough, right? Uh, we have uh, uh, we have plow Cloth. Uh, what are what are these words, right? Uh, and and why do we have this, right? Uh, it's just a bizarre setup that we have all these different pronunciations. So we have different pronunciations for words. At the same time, we have different pronunciations for vowels. Uh, the letter A, four, five, six possible different pronunciations for a word, for uh, that sound, depending on where it is, depending on what it's combined with. And because of this, it becomes a difficulty for students to learn language. Um, so those are some of the influencing factors. And again, I mentioned more than the ones that were listed, so please be aware of those. All right. <clears throat> so we have difficulties in learning, and we have different students with different profiles. And then, of course, we have to teach them uh, the ins and outs of reading so that they can be literate uh, or literate in reading as it were. Um, the process here is similar to all the other times that we've looked at what process do we do in order to do something. First thing that we're going to be doing is we're going to identify what the students needs are. What are their literacy needs? Do they know about things like phonics? Do they know, do they understand all of the elements that are involved? Do they understand uh, about skimming and scanning and um, and the like. 
where do they need to go? What do they know already? Do we need to identify what their needs are? Obviously, we also should identify the needs of uh, the school, of the family, uh, in order to do the next element here, which is select, mirror, uh, emplo um, select materials to employ. That was good, wasn't it? Select materials to employ. So uh, then you need to go out and find materials. And obviously, when you're create, when you're looking for materials, you need to make sure that your materials are meaningful, meaningful to the students. <clears throat> Another thing that you'll want to do is literally read to your students. Lots of input here is going to help them uh, not only understand the hearing elements of it, but when you're reading to them and you're walking through the process, they're going to learn a whole bunch of things because you're becoming a good model to them. So. Uh, you'll want to spend time reading to the students. And eventually, when they get older, you're going to make making sure that they're spending a lot of time reading, um, although not necessarily in class. Next point here, take advantage of the student's schemata. Take advantage of their background knowledge. Uh, obviously, this means, again, when you're going to take advantage of their background knowledge, you got to ooh, go back here and say, did I collect the information that I need in order to do that? Find out what they know. Obviously, uh, you can also... Um, um, you know, interview students as you go along the way, but you want to take advantage of that background knowledge. If they already know something, it's going to be a, an easier process in helping them learn vocab, learn, uh, learn to read. Big element here in developing literacy is uh, um, developing their lexicon. Um, over and over and over again, I stress to students who are learning a second language, your biggest hurdle will be vocabulary. It, uh, after a certain amount of time, the study of grammar ends, uh, and people have understood the system, and they've taken it uh, from their, or at least the majority of the system, they've taken it from their short-term memory, stuck it into their long-term memory, and now they're using it without even thinking about it. However, their lack of vocabulary is going to in uh, inhibit their, their progress and also their use of language. Talk to any student, foreign student, coming into the United States to study at a university, and their primary complaint that first year will be the overwhelming amount of material that they have to digest because they don't know the vocabulary. And as again, we've said this before, the amount of vocabulary they need is somewhere in the neighborhood of eight to 10,000 words for a typical college student, and they just don't get that in, in uh in their classes. So developing vocabulary should be a very large push. We've talked about this before in other other areas, what they need in order to do that. Make sure that you incorporate meaningful reading and writing activities. Again, that means you need to know what your, who your students are and uh, so that the materials you employ, the activities that you do, should be meaningful to them, something they want to do, something that they find valuable so that they will be more involved in it. And then lastly, according to Kala, teach language learning strategies. That's a big push all the time. The more strategies that students can learn and employ, the more independent they can become and the more responsibility they can take over their own language learning. And that's all for this particular chapter in learning literacy. There are other classes that you guys will be taking regarding uh, literacy. This is a call-based uh, emphasis, um, not very dissimilar from other types of systems, but it is one that you may need to know in case that uh, you, know, you ever get tested on this, which you may. <laughs> Uh, that's all for this uh, lesson. If you guys have any questions, please give me a holler on email or on Skype. Bye-bye.